Carolyn. I talk it. Can you hear me now? Nope. Oh, good. Well, I'm so flattered that I have this overflowing audience. I'm sorry, anyone who is uncomfortable. Um, I soon you'll be getting chairs. That's what I hear. Um, well, as Carolyn said, this is my book, Dear Abigail, is the story of three 18th century women. Mary Cranch, Abigail Adams, and Elizabeth Shaw Peabody. And I know that everybody in this room will no doubt know who Abigail Adams is. In fact, I feel like probably living in this environment, you could tell me a lot about Abigail that I still don't know. Um, but why, as Carolyn also said, why is it that Abigail is the one name that we all know. And it really is because of her man, because she married John Adams. And I must say, being here today, I feel sort of like I've come home, because I've come to John and Abigail's home, and, and also a home that all three sisters spent a lot of time in. But the other two sisters that I think you know less about, I argue in my book, are, even though they didn't marry presidents, they're equally important and remarkable women. First, there's the oldest sister, Mary Cranch, and she was sort of the uncrowned queen of the family because in the Puritan family, hierarchy was very important, and she was born first, so she was the firstborn, she was very important and especially after her brother was disinherited by their father, she was really the one who inherited the, the, the first son's role because there was no brother. And then when she grew up, she proved herself to be just a wonderful administrator. So even though she was a woman and couldn't be elected to any position, she was the de facto mayor of Quincy. And her husband would be appointed to positions, but really everyone would know Mary would take care of everything. And then there's Elizabeth Shaw Peabody, who was the youngest sister, and always thought that neither of her older sisters gave her enough attention, and she was constantly clamoring, listen to me, listen to me. And she was also the most literate and the best educated of the three of them. She had the ambition, when she was young, to grow up and become a published writer, a published letter writer. It was the golden age of letter writing. And she wanted her letters to be published like Madame de Sevigny's. And I'll let you read the book to find out whether that actually happened. But she did become, with her husband, the founder of the second coeducational school in America. So that itself was pretty impressive. The working title for my book was Threefold Chord, and somehow I still think of this book as Threefold Chord because it speaks to the interwovenness of these three sisters and the intensity of their bond. A threefold chord, it's a reference to Ecclesiastes, and it speaks to a chord that's wound over three times and it's very hard to break a chord that's wound over three times. And the sisters referred to threefold chord throughout their lives. Abigail wrote something that I thought was particularly moving when in a letter to her son, John Quincy. She said, never was there a stronger connection, affection, than that which binds in a threefold chord your mama and her two sisters. And as I was writing this book, I wanted the idea of sisterhood to resonate. I wanted the reader to know that while I'm speaking very specifically about three biological sisters living 250 years ago, that what is true for them can also be true for women today who aren't biologically related, who are perhaps best friends. So I thought before I went into more detail, 
I'd say a little bit about how I came to write this book in the first place. And I had just finished a book on the great radical feminist Mary Wollstonecraft. And I had loved living in the late 18th century. I loved all the drama. I even loved the guillotine, the revolutions. <laughs> Particularly, I loved the ideas. I loved what Rousseau and Hume and Locke all had to say. And I loved it that the character I was writing about had read all of these people. So I thought, OK, let me find some other man <coughs> or woman and follow them through the same period. And I'm a Francophile, as any of my close friends can tell you. So I thought, wow, if I can think of a French person, then I can just do Paris and the French Revolution all over again. But I was having a lot of trouble thinking of a French person who might fit into my category. And one day a colleague said to me, what do you have against Americans? <laughs> and I don't have anything against Americans. I love Americans. I am one. So about a week later, I was in the shower. And all of a sudden, and this is not an apocryphal tale. This is true. I remembered a book that I had reviewed for the Village Voice 15 years earlier that was called The Adams Women, and which I believe is in the library at there. And mostly it was about Abigail Adams and her daughter-in-law, <laughs> Louisa, married to John Quincy. But there were some very tantalizing sections that were about Abigail's sisters. And as I was standing there in the shower with soap coming down my back, I all of a sudden had this image flashed before me of one of the last lines in the epilogue. And it said, someday somebody will write a biography of the three sisters from Weymouth. And I thought, aha, that's me. <coughs> but after the aha, there was a lot of work to be done. <laughs> that aha moment is always so great. And then afterwards, the groan, oh no, do I have the material to write this book? So I knew that I had the wonderful Massachusetts Historical Society. I knew that I had this, this wonderful Adams site. So, and I knew that they would have a lot on Abigail. But then my question was, what about Mary? What about Elizabeth? Are there letters from them? What did Abigail say to them? What did they say to Abigail? And what did they say to each other? So at first I heard there's a nice collection of Elizabeth Shaw Peabody's, the younger sisters, correspondence at the Library of Congress. And I went down to the Library of Congress and I was delighted. Because there I found letters from the times when she, time when she was a teenager. And she was writing her cousin Isaac, who was off at Harvard, and he would he would give her suggestions about books to read. And she would write him back her opinions of the books. And she was very contrary. No matter what he said, she said the opposite. So I thought, well, this is great. You know, I have this really feisty character that I can deal with. And also that it was particularly funny because you could see how Isaac was sort of baiting her. So at one point, he writes her about Madame de Sevigny. Oh, you must really love this collection of Madame de Sevigny because you're just like her. She didn't think much of marriage, and neither do you. Well, not only was Elizabeth thinking of marriage, she was thinking of marrying Isaac. So she was, <laughs> she was really very strong in her reply to that. Um, so then there, so I had Elizabeth, and I had also Elizabeth when she grew older, and there were tragedies in her life, and. I'm going to leave you to read the book to find them out. But there was Mary Cranch. And I thought, OK, what do we have on Mary? Mary's the eldest. I know Abigail looked up to her. But what else is there about her? And did she have any ideas? And I went to the Albany Institute of History and Art. And there is a wonderful collection there. And among the letters that they have is a letter where she says to Abigail, don't you think it's silly that men think that we don't have the same intellects that they have? Now today, 